So just a super brief history. I'm with Durapak. Uh, we actually celebrated our 50 year anniversary last year. Um, we entered the cannabis space in 08 when Michigan went medical, uh, mostly on the pouch side. Um, and then we started growing into the automation equipment side. We're a little unique in that we actually manufacture not only the equipment, but actually all the pouches and consumables in-house. So it gives us a little unique perspective because we thoroughly understand both sides of it. Um, and we do all, we actually do all of our manufacturing right here in Michigan, uh, just on the road in Taylor. Um, so a little bit about me. So I'm native to Michigan. Um, I'm actually third generation in our business. My grandfather started it in the seventies. Um, my dad broke all sort of child labor laws and started putting me to work at 12, writing software for machines. Um, and on a personal note, I have four kids, 14 chickens, and actually number five on the way. So if I haul ass in an emergency, she's doing a day now. So, <laughs> um, so today is going to be two sections. We're going to start talking about the container side first uh, with the emphasis on flexible packaging. Um, and then we'll dive into the automation piece. Um, so kind of contrasting the two different container types, flexible versus rigid. Um, the cool thing about flexible is you get a lot better print options. The way flexible packaging is printed, it's a complete flat web, so you get full edge to edge, high color graphics. Um, rigid containers, it's pretty low quality printing if you wanna print directly on the container, which kind of sucks. So you usually have to result to printing labels and then applying those. Um, and the downside is it adds more costs and more steps and it's more time consuming. Um, so as a result, flexible packaging is always lower cost. Um, rigid comes at a higher cost. Flexible is more environmentally friendly, which we'll do a deeper dive on this later, but um, there's a lot less material that goes into a flexible package. Um, cool thing about rigid containers, it's a higher end appearance. So even when a lot of people go flexible or something like flower product, they'll still kind of put their high end flower in rigid for that reason. Um, flexible is a lot easier to carry and transport. It's easy to put a bag, you know, in a back pocket or a purse or something like that compared to like a big glass jar. Um, but the cool thing about rigid containers is it protects everything from physical damage. So again, this is why a lot of people use it for like their high end flower, because if you put it in a pocket, your flower won't get damaged. Um, so now we're going to cover all the different printing options for flexible packaging. There's two basic types. There's traditional analog printing. Um, you often hear this referred to as like flexible printing. And then there's the, the newer technology. And this is what we spend most of our time doing, which is digital printing. Um, so to kind of understand analog printing, it helps to understand where it came from. So when we say traditional analog printing, it's pretty much the same thing that Gutenberg invented in like the 1400s, right? So it's the technology where you engrave something, you slap ink on it, and you just put it on paper, film, or anything like that. Um, it actually goes all the way back to the 800s. They discovered later that the Tang Dynasty was doing this in the 800s. So whenever you hear flexible, um, traditional analog printing, this stuff goes back hundreds of years. Uh, so it is extremely outdated, but it gave us cool things like the Bible and the end of prohibition. Um, so digital printing, um, the way if you, if you look at an analog press is you're pretty much going through a bunch of ink baths. And so you start with typically white, which does a really nice flood coat for all the other colors. And if you've ever bought, has anyone ever bought labels or anything where you had to buy printing plates or like one-time tooling piece? Um, if you do, that's essentially what you're buying. It's a printing plate and this is what you have to buy per color. Um, so you have like an ink bath with a printing plate. Uh, you have an impression roller that's just gonna apply pressure down onto whatever you're printing, in this case film. And so typically you flood it with white and then you go through all these individual colors. So you go through like cyan, magenta, yellow, and then what they call key, which is basically just black. And it's the overlaying of all these individual colors that then gives you a full color image. Um, and then traditional analog printing, whenever you go to change like a skew or a print or like a flavor, all of those print cylinders have to physically be taken off the machine. You usually have to drain the ink pass, you have to clean it. And these presses are physically huge. It's like three to four times the length of this room, right? So this makes it almost impossible to do short runs. Or if you're doing, you know, a lot of different skews or change outs, that's what makes this technology not a great fit. Plus it's expensive because all those individual plates you actually have to buy. Um, so the cool thing about digital printing is it uses the same concept of overlaying colors. So you're still going to flood it with white. Um, but instead of having this physical cylinder, it's just the digital print head that basically like squirts the ink onto whatever you're printing. And so we're still going to flood it with white and then we're going to hit cyan, magenta, yellow and black. So we're still going to overlay the same colors to get your full color image. But these presses are tiny. You can easily fit one inside this room. And the cool thing is the press basically changes over on the fly. So if you're printing gummies and you're printing like a watermelon flavor without even stopping the press, the press can automatically change to the next flavor. 
So this technology is what lets you do a lot of different SKUs in really, really short runs. Um, so to really understand, it kind of helps to look at cost examples between digital and analog. Um, so say we're printing 10,000 bags, two SKUs. So whenever we say SKU, anything that changes in the print just creates a new SKU. So we're going to do 10,000 bags, two SKUs, digital, that's about a 50 cent bag. In the traditional space, because these presses are so huge and take so long to set up, like you can't even do this short of a run. So pre-digital, you just always had to buy, you know, a shit ton of bags of labels to be able to print. Um, but now let's say you are buying a lot more. So say you're doing a quarter million, two SKUs. So your digital price is going to go down. Um, your analog price is cheaper, but you're going to drop 4,500 bucks on those printing plates. And so if you amortize that into the price, now your bag cost still is 35 cents. And so in theory, when you go to reorder, you get to save those five cents because you're reusing the printing plates. But the problem is in an industry like cannabis, where everything changes like every other day, right? Marketing comes up with new ideas. The MRA makes some legal change. The odds of you getting a reused printing place in this industry is actually very, very, very low. So usually even at this point, we recommend people stay digital. Um, but where digital really signs is say you're doing high volume runs, but instead of two SKUs, you're doing 10. Um, so your digital price is the same because it can change between those 10 SKUs on a fly. The digital press doesn't care. Um, on the analog press, though, you're going to drop 20 grand on printing plates. So all of a sudden, if you amortize that, now you actually have a more expensive bag. And now you're really, really high risk because if anything changes and your printing has to change, now you just have to spend 20 grand on printing plates. So typically, even if you run the math on plates and it seems like it's going to be cheaper going traditional analog, in this industry, we pretty much always recommend staying digital because everything changes so quickly. Um, so now we'll dig down in the film laminations. Uh, it's pretty common to look at a bag and think that it's really just like one layer of film, like it's just a plastic bag, but in reality, it's multiple layers laminated together. Um, so the outermost layer of pretty much every bag is a material called PET. Um, and it's really just a clear surface. If you're doing like a matte bag, this is what gives you that soft touch matte feeling on the, on the surface. Um, Below that is the metalized layer. Um, so this is what is done in like a typical Mylar bag. And that's what gives it that shiny silver appearance. So that metalized layer is what gives you your shelf life and makes the bag like odor or smell proof. Um, and then on the very inside, there's a layer of some type of heat sealable material. Pretty much every bag, every piece of film in the world, it's some version of PE or polyethylene. So you'll see some acronym, in this case, LLDPE. But the key is the PE, the polyethylene, is what allows the bag to get formed into a bag and allows you guys to heat seal the top of it. Um, and so that's kind of like a picture of like a typical Mylar pouch. So when you see film specs, you'll typically see it like this, where you'll see all those acronyms separated by slashes. And from left to right is from the outside in. So whatever you see on the left is on the outside of the pouch and you kind of work your way in. And then you'll typically see like in parentheses or like a comma, the overall thickness in mills. And the thing to keep in mind in thickness is sometimes you'll see like a four mil pouch and then you'll see like a five mil pouch. And in theory, you think the five mil pouch has a better barrier or somehow better, but it's actually not. All they do when they make a thicker pouch is they just make that inside sealant layer thicker. And the inside sealant layer actually gives you no shelf life. It gives you nothing. It's literally just sealant. So it gives you the perception it's a better bag because it's thicker. It feels thicker in your hands, but it actually doesn't give you any better shelf life. There's no better odor protection. It's basically the same. Um, and if you did, you know, a non-printed bag, the silver is going to come through. Uh, if you did a printed bag, the ink actually is not on the surface of it. The ink is trapped between those middle two layers. That's why if you ever take like a printed pouch, so you can scratch it all you want. The ink will never come off because the ink actually is not printed on the surface. It's trapped between those two layers. Um, so now let's talk about film barrier. So this is basically what makes a bag uh like odor or smell proof or preserves the product so to understand how barrier works it helps understand how we test it so the way we test this is we have these lab instruments and you put a piece of film in it and it puts pure oxygen on one side and then pure nitrogen on the other and then we have a sensor that can actually measure oxygen and so we like to think bags and film are actually airtight but every film in the world does allow air and moisture to pass through it and then this instrument measures the rate and then so what happens is over time, and it's usually about a 24 hour test, the oxygen molecules will actually make its way through the film onto the nitrogen side. And with the sensor, we can measure it. And then we measure the rate over time. And so whenever you're looking at specs, you'll see acronyms like OTR, which is your oxygen transfer rate. 
or WVTR, which is like water vapor. It's like a moisture transfer rate. And the big thing to keep in mind is you want this number to be as low as humanly possible. So that LLDPE layer, that heat seal layer, if you had a bag made just out of that material, it's a horrible barrier. Your number would be in the thousands of like your OTR. But like your typical Mylar pouch, it's like fractions. So you really want to see small decimals uh, in this industry because everything in this industry needs to be really, really high barrier. Uh, so often overlooked thing that we come up, we see a lot is pouches that are poorly sized for filling, especially automating. Um, a lot of people get really excited and they start designing and doing graphics on a bag and they jump the gun and order a shit ton of them. And then they get them in only to find out that the product won't fit or maybe the product will fit by hand, but you actually can't run it on a machine. So these are the steps that we recommend. Um, so it's a good idea to get some plain pouches from, you know, your supplier, a company like us of all the different sizes and just manually fill them. And what you want is you want to check for what we call headspace. And headspace is just that amount of space uh, between your product and the top of the bag. So if you look at that picture on the left, that bag is way too full. You'll never be able to automate it. What you want to see is something more like the picture on the right where you have that gap on the top. Um, once you do this, you need to perform what we call a drop test which is basically taking the bag, going through a funnel and making sure that the product on its own will fall into the bag. Uh, irregular sized product like cannabis flower doesn't always wanna go into the bag. So the trick is to make the bag maybe wider and a little bit shorter to mitigate that bridging problem. Um, if the drop tests work out, the next phase is we really recommend getting just some plain clear pouches and actually running it on your equipment. It's one thing to be successful five or six times on a conference room table but on the production floor, we're looking at hundreds or thousands. So we recommend doing some trial with plain pouches. Um, and then now when you go through these steps, now we could give you like the die line for the physical dimensions. And now you can lay the artwork over and then actually proceed with confidence that when you order the pouches, you know, they're actually going to work for you. Um, so now let's talk about child resistance. So there's a ton of options for child resistance out there. Um, but because there are so many options, you really need to do dil diligence and verifying the certification. There's a lot of stuff that says it's Sierra child resistant, but actually never went through the appropriate testing. Um, and you need a material that supports an extremely strong uh, seal and bond. And you also need a film that's very puncture resistant. Um, I have four kids. They're super resilient. They'll try anything to get inside a package. So they'll often bite and tear at it. So you need a film that and if a kid's biting or tearing at it, it's not just going to break free and break loose. Um, and it's really important to vet the full supply chain. So you might be buying a pouch that has, say, like a certified zipper. But if it's being poorly made in a facility that's not doing the QC checks, that hasn't really done a lot of certified packaging, even though the zipper and maybe the material is certified, you can still end up with a poor quality pouch that a kid can easily get into. Um, and an often overlooked thing, if you're ever submitting anything for CR testing, is that because the word child is in it, we just like to think, oh, a kid can't get into it. But the way they do these tests is they put it in a room full of kids and the kids can't get into it. And they take the same pouches and they put it in a room full of seniors and the seniors have to be able to get into it. So if you make it so hard that a kid can't get into it, but a senior can't, you'll actually fail the test. And these tests aren't cheap. They're like 10 grand a pop, right? So it's good going in there, making sure that you satisfy both sides. Um, so now let's talk about green. Um, so we'll dig into some of the cool new things coming out, but it's also important just to understand the inherent benefits of green packaging compared to if you're doing like rigid packaging in like glass jars or cow containers. So one of the things to keep in mind is when you're getting like glass jars or calyx or any type of container, when those are shipped to you, you're mostly shipping air, right? And they're, it's, it's not dense at all. And so it's kind of a crazy stat, but one truckload of pouches because they ship flat is equivalent to 15 to 25 truckloads of like a glass jar or rigid container. So not only does that cost a shit ton more, but it's really bad for the environment, right? All that excess trucking and things like that. So just by going flexible, you're inherently more green, regardless of the material. Um, but now we'll talk about what's next. So there's a lot of emerging technologies. So you have recyclable, uh, compostable, biodegradable, and my personal favorite is the bio wax waterable which is just clever marketing people making up shit, making it sound like it's green, but it's really not, um, which takes us to the process of uh, greenwashing. And this is becoming more and more of a household term, but for those of you that don't know, um, it's basically just clever marketing, conveying that something is somehow green or good for the environment, but they just use bud words and really most of it's not. Um, so specifically in cannabis packaging, um, Recyclable is really what shows the most long-term promise because the recyclable can hit all the barrier properties that cannabis requires, but still be able to go through the recycle stream. 
Um, certified compostable, you'll see a lot of certified compostable packaging out there. Um, the crazy thing is you could put it in your at-home compost pile and it will sit there forever because it's industrial compostable. And who has ever taken anything to an industrial compost center? Nobody, because there's barely any of them, right? So if you're buying certified compostable packaging, if you read the fine print and like Google it, you'll find it's industrial compost only. So it's kind of like a greenwashing thing. Um, biodegradable pouches do exist. The problem is biodegradable pouches inherently are not high barrier, right? So to be biodegradable, you need to break down in the presence of things like moisture and oxygen and heat. And if you think about what a cannabis package has to do, it has to keep out moisture, oxygen, and heat, right? So being biodegradable and being high barrier, these two things tend to fight each other. Um, and then, you know, when in doubt, people will just make up a name that starts with bio or ends enable and try to trick people into buying it. Um, so mylar, the most common film uh, used in cannabis is not green. It's actually pretty horrible for the environment. Um, it's made up of a lot of different materials. The metallizing process that makes that silver layer is actually super environmentally not friendly. Um, so it's not sustainable, it's not biodegradable, it's not compostable or recyclable. Um, so it's very, very difficult to properly dispose of. Um, so what we've developed, we actually released it at the show, we have a bunch of these in our booth, is what we're calling Ecotech. Uh, so it actually has the same barrier characteristics as a mylar. So it's the same oxygen barrier, the same moisture barrier, the same odor protection, um, and it's recyclable. So some communities actually are starting to figure out how to curbside plastic bags, but a lot are still trying to figure it out because a lot of plastic bags will clog up recycling machines. Um, so not every municipality can curbside it, but pretty much every groceries chain, like Meyer and Kroger, all these guys, you can take your plastic shopping bags back to them and they'll recycle it. So any bag that we have with this technology, you can actually take back to the same grocery stores and they can recycle it for you. Um, there's also some cool at home things being developed where it's almost like a mini uh, trash compactor where you can put all your recyclable bags into it. And this thing will actually cube or brick it out. And by cubing or bricking it out, now it's a solid. Now you actually can curbside that. So that's something people can actually buy and use in their home today. Um, so I want to talk about the importance of sourcing pouches domestically in the cannabis industry. So full disclosure, we've been importing for like 15 years, um, but we will not import a cannabis pouch because of it's, it's just too important. So it's a very high risk profile. And what you'll find is like if you're importing them, you pretty much have to take responsibility for all the final QC checks to make sure that you're getting what you're paying for. So all the things that pouch manufacturers do to verify the oxygen permeation, burst testing, all this stuff, it's about a quarter to half million dollar lab that you essentially have to invest in and do all these tests yourself to make sure you're getting what you pay for. Um, and then we are all dying right now of all the supply chain issues, right? So shortening the supply chain and getting it domestically um, is pretty big. And you know, shipping costs has gone through the roof, wait times have gone through the roof. And the big thing that we see a lot of is people will save five, 10 cents a bag, but then it takes 10 to 30 weeks to get it. And in those 10 to 30 weeks, by the time they get the bags, everything changed. And next thing you know, they're relabeling the piss out of them. And that five to 10 cents they maybe saved per bag kind of went out the window, right? So a lot can happen in 10 to 30 weeks. Whereas like, a domestic digital run can be done in like a few weeks. So it makes you very agile to respond to all the changes in the industry. Um, so that kind of concludes the packaging side. So now we're going to flip and talk more about automation. Um, so a lot of stuff, especially in flour, is done with weights and measures. So a thing we see people get confused a lot in is you see resolution specs and accuracy. So I want to kind of contrast the two. So when you see scale resolution, it all it's saying is it's the smallest increment of weight that can be detected. Um, and all this is driven by is like these sensors and things engineered into the system. Um, and so you'll see this expressed, you know, in some unit of weight, like 0.01 grams. So you'll see like resolution, 0.01 grams. A lot of people see that and they confuse it with accuracy. So they say, oh, my resolution is 0.01 grams. My accuracy is going to be 0.01 grams, but it won't. Um, so the final accuracy will never be as good as the resolution. So accuracy is just how close a reported weight is to its true or verified weight. Um, so whereas the scale resolution is just driven by the electronics and the sensors, the accuracy is driven by the overall system design, the product that you're trying to run, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing to keep in mind is that your accuracy, it's never gonna exceed five to 10 times the resolution. So if you have a 0.01 gram resolution, you will never be able to claim a 0.01 gram accuracy. 
So like if you want a 0.01 gram accuracy, you need to go out a whole extra digit on your um, decimal. So like if you see equipment manufacturers saying that they have a 0.01 gram resolution and they're claiming that the scale is going to be accurate to 0.01 grams, it's actually statistically impossible. It can't happen. Um, so to take this further, we're going to contrast two different types of weighing technologies. So the machine on the left is what we call linear netware. These are cool, small, little tabletop machines. They work really, really good with granular product like coffee beans and granola and stuff. It's a horrible solution for things like cannabis flour. People are attracted to it because it's small and cheap, but we'll kind of dive into, you know, why it won't work for cannabis flour. So the way these systems work is you're just vibrating product into like a single scale bucket. Um, the other technology, which is called combination weighing, it actually leverages multiple scale buckets um, to give you an accurate final weight. And then, so we'll take this one step further. So if we look at a linear net weigher on the left, where you're just feeding product into a single scale bucket. If you're feeding a product like cannabis flour, you're at the mercy for whatever size bud is going to come next and drop into the scale. So if we're doing eight, three and a half grams, and we're at 3.17 grams, we're at the mercy of whatever bud falls next, right? So if it's a bunch of little ones, you actually stand a chance at hitting three and a half grams. But you have no idea what's going to come next. So say a larger nug drops in, now you're way over 4.3 grams, right? So even though my resolution on the scale is 0.01 grams, look how inaccurate I am, right? Just because of the overall system design. So the way you get accuracy is you use a more advanced technology like combination weighing. And the way these systems work is you basically get kind of a pseudo random amount of product dropped into each bucket. And as long as it's less than the total weight of 3.5 grams, um, you, the system actually doesn't care. And so what it does is it's a very advanced algorithm that finds the combination out of all of these to hit your exact weight. Um, so the systems we sell are 14 head systems. A 14 head system has over 16,000 possible combinations to get the right weight. And so what the system's gonna do is it's gonna analyze what buckets will give you exactly three and a half grams. So it's gonna find these four, and then boom, you get your three and a half grams exactly. So even though these two systems have the exact same scale resolution, you can see how the accuracy is fundamentally different. Um, so specifically for flower packaging, um, a mistake we see a lot is people buying non-purpose built machines for flower packaging. In like the edible space, you can use a lot of off the shelf food packaging machines, but flour is such a unique product that it really needs to be dedicated. So we see a lot of people buying machines for like potato chips or granola in the food industry, trying to run cannabis flour on it, and it doesn't have near the resolution you need, and it destroys all the cryotone. Uh, trichomes, et cetera, et cetera. So you need something that's purpose-built, has gentle handling. You need extremely high resolution scales, usually 10 times more high res than what you'd see in like the food industry. Um, and pretty much the only technology that can accurately weigh cannabis flour is the combination model. Um, and they come in different shapes and sizes, but the units we sell is this more compact round because um, you're going to need at least 14 buckets to be able to hit accurate weights on cannabis flour. Um, so now we'll talk more about edibles, uh, things like gummies. So there's two ways to count products like gummies. Uh, you can do it by optical or weight. Um, so optical counting traditionally requires really strict product orientation. Um, you got to make sure you don't drop two at a time. Um, weight base doesn't really care what falls off because it's weighing it. But the key if you're doing something by weight is you need very consistent piece weights. So if you're doing a 10 count and your piece weights vary by 10% or more, you'll never be able to weigh them because you're going to have that big of an error. Um, so now we'll kind of look at optical versus weight counting. So in a traditional optical system, um, you've got like a funnel going into a bag or some type of container, and you have uh, basically just like a laser beam or some type of a sensor. And so what's going to happen is as the product falls and drops, it's just going to increment the count. So the problem with this system, because it's just like a dumb laser that doesn't really know what's going on, is if you drop one, you're fine. If you drop two at the same time, it's going to count it as one. Right. So the machine thinks it's three. It's actually four. If two falls stuck together, which gummies like to stick together, same thing is going to happen. It thinks it's four, but really there's six. So now you have six in the bag, but the machine thinks it's four. So it's going to call for even more product. Right. And then when you drop that one, the machine's like, oh, I got five. But in reality, you just gave away two very expensive gummies into a pouch. Not to mention you broke some regulatory rules. Right. So if you're doing weight counting, you basically use the same technology that you would flour. And all the machine's gonna do is it's gonna convert the weight from grams into pieces. 
And it's the exact same algorithm that we looked at on the flower scale, right? So it's going to see what combination of buckets is going to give you your five count. And so it's going to find these buckets right here, realize that it adds up to five. So as long as you have a consistent piece weight, this system is a much better bet because it doesn't care if gummies are stuck or whatever, because they're always going to weigh as two if two are stuck together. So traditionally, we would always try to put people into weight-based counting solutions. Um, but then recently, we have a new partner that developed some pretty high-end uh, vision technology. We actually have one of these at our booth. Um, so instead of like a dumb laser that doesn't really know if it's one or two or whatever, this system uses multiple high-resolution CCD cameras. So it's basically like what's in your smartphone. Um, and it's looking at it from two sides with cameras. And then it has an array of air jets in case something doesn't conform. And then just for good measure, there's actually a third high resolution camera just to verify what the top two cameras saw. And then you, in this system, because you're actually analyzing it, you actually have a way of rejecting bad product. So if we go through the same scenario that we did on the last slide, so you drop one, this system isn't just counting though, it's actually going through geometric pattern matching and it's actually going through color matching. So before anything is counted, it goes through analysis. So that was just one gummy of the right type. So it's approved. We increment our counter by one. We drop another one, same thing. It's approved. We increment our counter. But now if it drops two, in the last slide, that would get counted as one. But because we have high resolution cameras looking at it from both sides, we know that we dropped two. So our count's still gonna be on, right? So we're able to count that. Now say you drop two stuck together. It knows that they're stuck together, but it, it fails the, the pattern match, right? Because two stuck together crisscross doesn't look like a normal gummy. And it recognizes that. So instead of letting it fall into the container, it's actually going to use a blast of air and reject that product so you won't see it. Um, and now let's say your mold is off and you end up with a half a gummy. Same thing. It's going to get rejected, right? Because it fails the geometric pattern match. And it'll throw that into the reject bin. Um, another cool thing is these cameras are full color. So if you're wanting, running like a watermelon and a lemon falls, it detects the color. And again, it can reject it. Um, so that won't get into the bag. And then now we'll just finish this out. We drop our last gummy. So in this scenario, all these crazy things happen, right? Two gummies fall stuck together, two fall side by side, a half a gummy or whatever. But our counts are still perfect. So traditionally, we would always put people in the weight-based systems because of the kind of like a dumb laser sensor. But now with this technology, we highly recommend going the counting method because now you get all this free inspection to go with it. Um, so now we'll talk about gas flushing. This is very common, like in the flower space, um, where jars or pouches will get nitrogen flushed before they're sealed. A lot of people think that nitrogen actually preserves flour and other products. It actually doesn't. The goal is to use an inert gas to get the oxygen out. It just so happens the air that we breathe, there's just a shit ton of nitrogen, right? So it's readily available. So the goal is to flush with nitrogen to get the oxygen out. And it's the act of getting the oxygen out that preserves the product. So the air that we breathe is roughly 20% oxygen. So when you're gas flushing, you're usually just trying to get that down to some single digit percentage, like two to 4%. Um, and ultimately you do this just to extend shelf life. A thing to keep in mind is you really want to make sure you're using a high barrier film. So we'll see people that invest all this money in gas flushing systems. And then they're using a crappy film with a horrible OTR and they flush all the oxygen out and it all comes right back in because they're using a bad film. Um, another cool thing you can do with the right mechanism is kind of like a potato chip bag. You can actually kind of poof your bag open and it gives it like a protective barrier during transit too. Um, so now we'll talk about printing and labeling. Um, there's three core technologies. And so these are different technologies you can use for either internal traceability or like metric tags. So the first technology is inkjet. This is the technology when you look close, you can see all the individual dots. So if you see like date and lot codes on a lot of food products that you buy, or like cans of Coke or Pepsi or whatever, you'll see all these small dots. Um, this is horrible in the cannabis space because you can't really print barcodes. And although that's very high speed, if those dots go in the wrong location, you'll easily miss fine point text. Your 2D barcode won't be legible. So we really don't recommend this technology at all in the cannabis space. Um, what we recommend is thermal transfer. So the way thermal transfer works is it heats up a ribbon and transfers ink. So the fidelity and the quality is substantially better than inkjet. And the cool thing about thermal transfer is you can thermal transfer a label and then with a print and apply unit, you can apply that label to virtually everything. So there's a mechanism that will put a label on anything. So you can print and apply and label pouches. You can do 360 degree wraps on jars. You can do all that stuff. Um, so an often overlooked thing in automation lines is the package inspection. Um, a very common machine we recommend at the end of the line is a checkware. 
And this is a, it's a really simple system where you just give it your over under tolerance and anything out of tolerance, it'll just kick it off the line. So it doesn't make it into your case packing. Um, an important thing to keep in mind is that if you're filling like calc containers or glass jars with flour, the container weights vary so much that you actually can't check weigh them. So what you actually need to do is you need to take into account the individual tear weight. So you actually need two check weighers. Or we actually have a purpose built solution that within a single turret will like weigh the jar, fill it, and then weigh it again. And within that system, check weigh it. So if you just buy an off the shelf check weigher and you're doing any type of rigid containing filling with flour, you're actually not going to get good results. Um, another important thing to have is something that's inspecting what's going on inside your package. So a very common and relatively cheap solution is just a metal detector. Um, cool thing about metal detectors is they're low cost and they're readily available. The bad thing is it won't detect everything. So to make it pretty useful, you have to invest in a lot of metal impregnated stuff in your facility. So you'll see a lot of facilities have metal impregnated band-aids. Uh, band on the equipment side, they'll get plastic bearings with metal in it. So if all these foreign contaminants fall in, the metal detector can still pick it up. Um, so really the best solution, even though it's more expensive, is an extra unit. So these do cost considerably more, but it's basically just like what you see at the airport on steroids. So instead of a human having to look at the screen, it's automated and it has advanced algorithms. So this can find any crazy thing that could ever make it into your product stream, uh, it can find in a package. And although it's expensive, it's a massive insurance policy because we've all seen what goes viral if somebody buys like something and there's a bone fragment or something weird inside, it will completely destroy your brand overnight. So even though it's expensive, it, it is a pretty good insurance policy. Um, another thing we don't see a lot of, but is really, really important is to invest in seal testing. So if you're doing any type of flexible packaging, it's important to make sure that your bag is actually sealed. Oftentimes you look at a bag and be like, oh, it looks like it's sealed. But if you were to put it in a unit like this, uh, the way these work is it's filled with water and you put, it's, it's a destructive test, but you put your pouch in, close it, turn it on, and it basically stresses the hell out of the package and it blows up like a balloon. And what you'll see is if you have a weak seal, it will could completely fail and just blow up in the chamber. But a common thing is that like in your seal tooling, you might have a tiny fragment. And then when the seal jaws come together, that creates what we call a channel leaker. And so if you put it in a machine like this, you're actually gonna see just a stream of bubbles come out of it. And this is something that you would never get with a visual inspection. So we typically recommend having these on the end of your line and then you just set a timer where every five, 10, 15, some interval, you're doing a destructive test where you're throwing one of these in the chamber. Um, so like I said, it just pulls an extreme vacuum to put a stress on it. Uh, it tests the film strength and integrity. Um, but the channel leaker is a big thing that it detects because that's something that you would never see visually. Um, so now I want to talk about scaling automation. Um, we actually spend a lot of time downselling people. Uh, automation is cool and it looks fun. And if people are well-funded, they'll come in and they're like, you know what? I want to automate everything. And that's usually the biggest mistake in the world. So we spend a lot of people, a lot of time downselling people and really getting to understand what their batch and run size is. So if you're doing cannabis flour and you're doing a lot of really small batches, you know, fractions of a pound, maybe one or two pound tops. And if you buy this big, fully automated machine, you're pretty much going to lose your ass in the ROI and all the changeover and cleaning, right? So the more you automate, the larger you need your batch and run sizes to be. So sometimes you kind of have to balance your run size with your production throughput. And if, you, if you're doing a lot of smaller batches, it actually makes more sense to do like a semi-automatic solution where there's still some human involvement, but the human is a lot more efficient with a little bit of help of automation than automating everything to the help. Um, and we, we're happy to help people figure this out. So like we can go in Excel and look at your batch and run sizes and help you guys figure out what level of automation it probably makes sense to start with and then where you could grow into it and what, when it makes sense to grow into those next steps. Um, then I'd like to talk about footprint and utility requirement. So as you're starting to plan into automation, you really, really need to start planning your space as early as possible. Um, we run into this in the majority of our installations where there's just not physical space for the automation. And a lot of people think in two dimensions, it's like, oh, I have plenty of floor space, but pack packaging machines go vertical and they go vertical pretty quick. So if you've got eight to 12 foot ceilings, you're gonna have a hell of a time trying to automate. You really need more like 15 to 20 foot ceilings because all of these machines start stacking on top of each other and it gets pretty tall pretty quick. Um, 
A lot of people have the correct power requirements, but not everybody has compressed air in their facility. Uh, pretty much every piece of automation uses compressed air. And you need not only a really good stable compressed air supply, but you need to make sure that it's clean and dry. So your average like Home Depot shop compressor is not going to run your automation. It might work at first, but really it's going to pump a ton of water through the lines and your machines are literally going to rust from the inside out. And you're not going to know it till it's too late. Um, so double check electrical requirements. Most facilities are going to have 110. Most lighting circuits are 208. Uh, but some machines require high voltage least three phase power like 460. So it's important to work with your potential equipment suppliers really, really early on to make sure that your facility can run it. Um, and another thing we run into a lot is door size where some will have 15, 20 foot ceilings, huge space, but they have like a tiny man door to fit it through. And we've seen people bust out walls on a whim and all sorts of crazy stuff trying to get it in there. So it's helpful to plan all this stuff ahead of time. Um, so I just covered a lot pretty quick, but we do free packaging consultations all the time. So if anybody has any specific requirements or applications, you can actually reach out. We can schedule either on site or like a remote team saying to go over your specific needs. Um, my marketing guy likes putting my face on everything, I think. But we also like doing tours of our facility. We always have test equipment. So you guys can come. You can bring a uh, product. We can run them on the machine with you. Um, do full factory tours. So just reach out. We can schedule a date and time. Um, and then you get to meet the whole, all the engineers, everyone that designs anything. If you have any super, super in-depth uh, questions, we have all the people on staff that can answer them for you. Um, and we're right by the airport uh, in Taylor. So that concludes it. Any questions? You guys good? You're all packaging experts now. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys.